So today we're at the first Sunday of Lent, uh, which calls us to a greater discipline, courage, vigilance, and a stronger faith in God. So today's readings are all about temptation, and they give us examples of successes and failures when it comes to overcoming these temptations. In the first reading, reading, Adam and Eve failed when tempted. In the gospel, Jesus is tempted over and over and over again, but never fails. So what are temptations and where do they come from? It's a dictionary explanation. Temptation is the inner desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. So temptation entices us to do evil, which explains where they come from, which is Satan, as we read in today's gospel. But temptation also comes from within us. This is a passage from the letter of James. Blessed is the man who perseveres in temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life that he promised to those who love him. No one experiencing temptation should say, I am being tempted by God. For God is not the subject of temptation to evil, and he himself tempts no one. Rather, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So temptation is always something deceptively good to the eyes and enticing to the appetite. But unfortunately, these things are fundamentally evil and destructive to our spiritual life. Therefore, temptation comes from Satan and from our own fallen nature. Temptation is not a sin, but the moment we entertain it and act on it, then it becomes a sin. The fall of Adam and Eve in the first reading demonstrates this. God created mankind after he had created the universe and made everything all well and good, making us in his own image. God made everything to be all good and perfect for us to enjoy for eternity, full of grace and love of God. We were created to share in the love of God, but unfortunately, the sweet talking by Satan led to Adam and Eve listening to his temptations and falsehoods rather than to trust in God. Satan tempted Adam and Eve by playing into their desires and their curiosity for knowledge and understanding of good and evil like God himself. Yet, it was by their disobedience against God that they allowed sin to enter into their hearts and minds, taking them away from the fullness of God's grace and love. It's because sin and wickedness have no place before God. Therefore, sin has held dominion over all of us ever since, ever since then, right up until the moment when God sent us his own begotten son. So through Christ, all of us have seen, witnessed, and received the perfect manifestation of God's love. God truly loves each and every one of us. He is patient with us, reaching out to us with genuine love and compassionate mercy. He gave us his beloved son because through him we are led out of the darkness of sin. St. Paul spoke about this in the second reading on how sin had entered this world through the first man, Adam. But then God gave us the gift of his only begotten son to, con to come into our world and become man like us to be the perfect example of obedience to our Heavenly Father, leading us all on the path toward full reconciliation and reunion with the Lord, who loves each one of us without exception. St. Paul highlighted the difference between what Adam, the first man, had done in listening to st Satan instead of listening to God, choosing to obey the words of Satan along with Eve, so that they ended up disobeying God and doing what the Lord had forbidden them to do. Compared to Christ, who showed us all the example of perfect obedience to the will of God. Our Lord obeyed the Father's will so perfectly and well 
that he obeyed even when he had to bear the burden of, of his cross, which is all our sins, evils, and wickedness, our faults and corruption that le has led to our death and destruction. Yet, by his great and ever patient enduring love, God himself has willingly done this for all of us. He did it for all of us, he could, for all of us, so that by his most loving and selfish sacrifice on the cross, he could save us from our own destruction. In the gospel, we heard how the Lord himself was tempted by Satan. The Lord spent 40 days of physical fasting and spiritual exercise in the desert, where Satan came to, to him and tried not to just once tempt him, but three times to stop his work and mission in this world by offering him the same kind of persuasions and temptations that he still uses on us today. Satan struck with all that he had, tempting the Lord with all sorts of temptations, by first tempting him with the satisfaction of the flesh through food and pride, and another one through ego and pride, and finally, the greed and desire for worldly glory and fame. Satan tempted Adam and Eve with the allure of knowledge and greatness, so that by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden, expressly prohibited by God, they could become equal like God, to be like God in his might and knowledge, tempting them with glory, power, and knowledge, among others, which moved them to disobey God instead of trusting in God and his providence. But this failed to tempt the Lord, who showed us the perfect example of obedience as he obeyed his Father's will and refused to bend to the demands of Satan or even paying attention to his falsehoods and lies. He refuted Satan's claims and lies and spoke of the truth that he himself has brought into our world. When Satan tried to highlight to the Lord that he is the Son of God, trying to sway him by pride and ego to do something for his own selfish gain and benefit by turning the stones into bread to nourish himself. The Lord rebuked Satan and rejected his effort in tempting him by saying that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Instead of doing something for the sake of his own benefit, the Lord chose to do what is most unconventional and that is to do what he had done for everyone's sake in giving himself to all. Instead of, the, instead of turning the stones into bread for his own consumption, he, who is the bread of life, chose himself for everyone in a most selfless sacrifice for the salvation of us all. So next, Satan brought the Lord to the temple, trying to trick him by the fame and glory that he offered. The Lord told Satan once again that one should not put the Lord, your God, to the test, which is an important reminder for each of us today to not lose faith in the Lord. Instead, we must keep our faith in the Lord and put our focus on him and not to indulge in the desire to be seen or be praised for our actions. Everything we do in our lives should be done to glorify the Lord by our own life and our works which should be in line with the will of God. We should not seek to be selfish in pursuing personal glory and satisfaction over our obedience and faith in God and also our love for one another. Lastly, the Lord rebuked Satan when he showed him the magnificence of all the kingdoms of the world as Satan desperately tried to bring the Lord to succumb to the temptation of worldly goods and riches. The Lord rebuked him again with the words that the Lord God alone is worthy and shall be worshipped. Essentially, the Lord proclaimed to Satan that in the end, the justice and goodness of the Lord will triumph over him, and that the faith in the Lord alone will lead us, humanity, to salvation through Christ. All of us are reminded today that we must not allow ourselves to be swayed by the lies and, and false promises of Satan, and those sent to persuade us to abandon our path and journey towards the Lord. We must be vigilant and not allow ourselves to be corrupted by our own pride, ego, arrogance, desires, and greed, 
jealousy, lust, and every other thing which we often encounter in our daily lives. We must follow the example shown by our Lord himself, as well as the innumerable, innumerable saints and martyrs who have resisted the temptations to sin, temptation of worldly glory, fame, and ambition in our hearts and minds. We are called to deepen our relationship with God by filling this Lenten season with prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. By carrying out these actions and fulfilling what we have been recommended to do during Lent, we should do them with the right intention and pur purpose to bring ourselves closer to God and distance ourselves from Satan and all those who seek our destruction and our damnation. We should make good use of whatever opportunities and time provided to us and do what we can to live our lives worthily of the Lord. We must have a good and vibrant prayer life. We use prayer to communicate with our Lord, and all of us may come to deeper appreciation of God's love and actions through our interactions and time spent with him in prayer and through other means, like adoration, to reach out to him. And when we fast, we should do so because we want to restrain the temptations of our flesh, which can be indeed weak in the face of relentless attacks and temptations that are all around us. We should not fast because we seek praise for our actions, but rather we fast because we have that genuine and strong desire to distance ourselves from sin and come closer to God and his merciful love. We should, we should also be ever more generous in almsgiving, that is, in giving whatever we can spare for those around us who may be less fortunate. Almsgiving should not be limited to material things, but should also include our time and attention, our love and care, especially for those less fortunate and loved all around us today. During this time of Lent, every one of us are reminded to deepen our relationship with God through faith, charity, and love, while at the same time rejecting Satan and all of his false promises and lies and resist the many temptations. We are all called to be ever more faithful to God and to be good and worthy role models of our faith, inspiring others to follow in our footsteps. So during this season of Lent and beyond, we must prepare ourselves for the great journey that's ahead of us. We must be firm in prayer and be watchful so that we do not fall to the temptations of the evil one.